find in Numbers chapter 8. Now in order to understand this story I have to give you a little bit of background. God chose Moses to be the ruler of Israel. And he also chose Aaron to be his spokesman. In other words, Moses was supposed to th sit on the throne of Israel and Aaron was supposed to be the mouthpiece of Moses before the congregation. And uh, we could express it as Moses being the king and Aaron being the priest. Actually we're going to find that the roles of Moses and Aaron represented the same roles of God the Father as the ruler of the universe and Jesus Christ the spokesperson for the Father and actually the priest of God the Father. Now we need to say a few things about the identity of Korah. Korah actually uh, decided at a certain point, we're going to notice in our study, to challenge the leadership of Moses and also of Aaron. Even though God had chosen Moses as the leader and Aaron as the priest, Korah decided that he was going to challenge this arrangement which God had established. Now who was Korah? Korah was a member of the tribe of Levi, but he was not of the house of Aaron. So that's a very important distinction because all priests had to be from the house of Aaron. And uh, Korah was not of the house of Aaron even though he was a Levite. Now the Levites fulfilled very important uh, tasks in relationship to the sanctuary. Very important ministries and services on behalf of the congregation. In fact we know that the Levites uh, had many functions relating to the sanctuary and that actually they were set aside by God by the laying on of hands. In other words they were separated for their ministry, they were separated for their functions by God having hands laid upon them. This will be a very important detail as we study along. Now we're ready to turn in our Bibles to the book of Numbers chapter 8 and let's read verse 10. So you shall bring the Levites before the Lord and the children of Israel shall lay their hands on the Levites. So the Levites were chosen and ordained by God to the position which they occupied in the sanctuary. It's important to realize that the Levites were not priests. They were called to a special ministry. They were ordained by the laying on of hands, but they did not have the function of the priesthood. But they had very important functions in the sanctuary. For example, they provided the music in the sanctuary service. Not only the choral music, but also the instrumental music. They were the ones who gathered the tithes of Israel. They bore the Ark of the Covenant. They pitched and tore down the tent as Israel walked through the wilderness. They were the custodians of the temple and of the sanctuary. They actually flayed the animals. And they also taught the law to the people. They were teachers in Israel. Now although they were ordained, they were not ordained as priests before the Lord. They were set aside for the function of a Levite, not for the function of the priesthood which belonged to the family of Aaron. This is a very important detail. I'm sure that many of the Levites were well qualified to serve as priests. In other words, they probably knew how to perform the work of the priest. And maybe some of them could even perform the work of a priest better than some of the priests. But you see, their function was determined not by their abilities, but by the fact that God had set them aside. Now we're going to notice in our study today a parallel 
between what happened with Korah's rebellion and what happened with the rebellion of Lucifer in heaven. Because what happened in the days of Korah was an earthly small scale reflection of the original rebellion of Lucifer against God in heaven. You see Moses and Aaron would represent God the Father who is the ruler of the universe and Jesus Christ who is the spokesman of the Father. He is the Word of God. He is the voice of God in other words. And Jesus was set aside in a special way as God's Son. He had a special position of honor and dignity. But there was another individual who had also been anointed because he's called the anointed cherub in Scripture. In fact this anointed cherub, his name was Lucifer, was actually also a master musician. He was the director of the heavenly choirs, just the, like the Levites were the musicians in the sanctuary in Israel. And we know that Lucifer was also an instrumentalist, because we're told in Ezekiel 28 that timbrels and pipes were prepared for him the day in which he was created. In other words, he was also set aside for a specific function, but he could not occupy the function of God the Father and the function of Jesus Christ. And so the time came, going back to the story of Israel, that Korah became unsatisfied with his position. He aspired to the position of being a priest because he considered this to be a higher office and a higher calling than of a mere Levite. And eventually we're going to find in this story that he not only aspired to occupy the position of a priest, but he also aspired to overthrow Moses from his throne and become the ruler of Israel. We find these very significant words in Patriarchs and Prophets, page 395. I'm going to be using several quotations from the chapter on Korah's rebellion because Ellen White describes this, describes this in such vivid terms. She says, Korah became dissatisfied with his position and aspired to the dignity of the priesthood. The bestowal upon Aaron and his house of the priestly office which had formerly devolved upon the firstborn son of every family, had given rise to jealousy and dissatisfaction. So you see that those who had been set aside as priests were looked upon as rivals by Korah. Interestingly enough. Now the same thing happened in heaven. Lucifer Desired, desired the position of the king. He desired the position of Jesus, the spokesman of God. We all know the verses of Isaiah 14 verses 13 and 14. I'm going to read those. Speaking about Lucifer it says, For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds and I will be like the Most High. I'm not going to be a second class citizen anymore. I'm not happy with the position of the covering cherub. I want to be like Jesus and eventually he also wants to overthrow the Father from his throne. Ellen White perceptively in Patriarchs and Prophets, page 35, describes the rebellion of Lucifer. She says, not content with his position, did you see this, the parallel here? Not content with his position, though honored above the heavenly host, as Korah was honored above the congregation of Israel, he ventured to covet homage due alone to the Creator. Instead of seeking to make God supreme in the affections and allegiance of all created beings, it was his endeavor to secure their service and loyalty to himself. And coveting the glory 
with which the infinite Father had invested His Son. This prince of angels aspired to the power that was the prerogative of Christ alone. Dissatisfied with his position to which he had been ordained by God, for which he had been anointed by God, and aspiring to a higher office, and being unhappy about the Father and the Son having higher positions than he. And so now a secret conspiracy began. It's described like this in Patriarchs and Prophets, page 395. She says, a deep laid conspiracy was formed, and you can find this in Numbers chapter 16. The result of a determined purpose to overthrow the authority of the leaders appointed by God Himself. Notice the description, a deep laid conspiracy was formed, the result of a determined purpose to overthrow the authority of the leaders appointed by God Himself. It's interesting to notice that Korah at first worked undercover by using deception. We find these words in Patriarchs and Prophets, page 395. For some time, Korah had been secretly opposing the authority of Moses and Aaron, though he had not ventured upon any open act of rebellion. In other words, he had harbored these feelings deep in his heart, secretly, undercover, wanting to occupy the position of Moses and Aaron, just like Lucifer wanted to occupy the position of Jesus and ultimately the position of God. In Patriarchs and Prophets, page 37, Ellen White tells us about Lucifer in heaven. Lucifer went forth to diffuse the spirit of discontent among the angels. And now notice this. He worked with mysterious secrecy and for a time concealed his real purpose under an appearance of reverence for God. In other words, he says, I'm not really fighting to overthrow God, I really want to improve upon the government of God. I'm doing this for the good of God, in other words. But actually, he's opposing God, as Korah was opposing Moses and Aaron. It's interesting to notice that Korah had a couple of co-conspirators that are mentioned by name. Their names are Dathan and Abiram. Interestingly enough, Dathan and Abiram were actually from the tribe of Reuben. And Reuben was the eldest son of Jacob. And so they said, the eldest son has the rulership function. So, so we should be the ones sitting upon the throne instead of Moses. And so now, the feelings that had begun with Korah in his heart, which he had harbored, he begins whispering among the leaders of Israel. And we're told in Patriarchs and Prophets, page 396, the following, professing great interest in the prosperity of the people, they first whispered their discontent to one another and then to the leading men of Israel. So it starts with Korah, he whispers it to Dathan and Abiram, and then they start whispering it among other prominent leaders in Israel. Because in order for this rebellion to be successful, they have to recruit followers. And so we're told in Numbers 16 that they were able to recruit 250 of the cream of the crop of Israel. We're told in Numbers 16, if you read with me, Numbers 16 verses 2 and 3, And they rose up before Moses with some of the children of Israel, 250 leaders of the congregation, representatives of the congregation, 
men of renown. They gathered together against Moses and Aaron and said to them, You take too much upon yourselves, for all the congregation is holy, every one of them, and the Lord is among them. Why then do you exalt yourselves above the congregation of the Lord? What makes you, Moses, think you're so great that you can rule over Israel? And what makes you, Aaron, think that you can be the only priest along with your household in Israel? Don't lord it over the people. Commenting about this in Patriarchs and Prophets, page 396, Ellen White remarks, Korah and his fellow conspirators were men who had been favored with special manifestations of God's power and greatness. Did you notice this? They had been given special manif manifestations of God's power and greatness. She continues saying, they were of the number who went up with Moses into the mount and beheld the divine glory. In other words, they were not the common folk of Israel down in the valley at Mount Sinai. These 250 leaders had actually gone all the way to the top of Mount Sinai and they had beheld directly the glory of God. You know, it makes me think of Lucifer. Lucifer had also been in the very presence of God. He had been next to the throne of God. He had actually shared in a certain sense the glory of the throne of God. Just like these leaders in Israel. Now what actually did Korah, Dathan, and Abiram and the 250 leaders want? Actually what they wanted to do was supposedly to improve the government. They actually wanted to get rid of the laws which restricted the freedom of Israel. In Patriarchs and Prophets, page 397, we find these words. They felt confident of making a radical change in the government and greatly improving upon the administration of Moses and Aaron. What is it that they wanted to do? Supposedly they wanted to improve the government, make a radical change in the government, and they wanted to improve the administration of Moses and Aaron. And so now they start repeating among the people, you know, Moses and Aaron, they lord it over you, they command you, you know, if you really accepted our leadership, things would go much better and you would have a lot more freedom. And soon the people started repeating what they heard from the leaders. And then the leader said, see the people feel the same way we do. But the leaders had planted this in the minds of the people already. So it wasn't the attitude of the people originally, it was the attitude of the leaders. Speaking about the rebellion of Lucifer in heaven, we find something very similar. These words come from Patriarchs and Prophets, page 37. Speaking about Lucifer, he began to insinuate doubts concerning the laws that governed heavenly beings. Intimating that though laws might be necessary for the inhabitants of the worlds, angels, being more exalted, needed no such restraint, for their own wisdom was a sufficient guide. They were not beings that could bring dishonor to God, all their thoughts were holy. Interesting expression because uh, Korah and Dathan and Abiram says all of the people are what? All of the people are holy. All their thoughts were holy. It was no more plausible for them than for God Himself to err. The exaltation of the Son of God as equal with the Father was represented as an injustice to Lucifer, who, it was claimed, was also entitled to reverence and honor. If this prince of angels could but attain to his true exalted position, great good would accrue to the entire host of heaven. 
for it was his object to secure the freedom for all. But now even the liberty which they had hitherto enjoyed was at an end. For an absolute ruler had been appointed them, and to his authority all must pay homage. So he's, what, what Lucifer is saying is, God and his son Jesus are dictators. And we need to overthrow those dictators, and if we do, things will improve, we'll have liberty and freedom, and everything will function better. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 38. Ellen White amplifies this rebellion in heaven. He cunningly drew his hearers on to give utterance to their feelings. Then these expressions were repeated by him when it would serve his purpose as evidence that the angels were not fully in harmony with the government of God. While claiming for himself perfect loyalty to God, he urged that changes in the order and laws of heaven were necessary for the stability of the divine government. Do you see how things are developing on earth just like they developed originally in heaven? Because the prince of darkness was behind both rebellions. And so now Korah, what had begun with Korah, and continued with Dathan and Abiram, and continued with the 250 princes, now begins to spread among the people. In fact, it was envy that led Korah to rebel against the authority of Moses and Aaron. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 37, tells us, Jealousy had given rise to envy, and envy to rebellion. In the same way, Story of Redemption, page 14, Ellen White says, Lucifer was envious and jealous of Jesus Christ. And so now these leaders have to recruit people from among the congregation to proliferate the rebellion. And they felt that the best way to win them over was to flatter them and make them feel good about themselves and make them think that Moses was an overbearing leader who need, needed to be thrown off the throne. I read from Patriarchs and Prophets, page 398, Korah's success with the people increased his confidence and confirmed him in his belief that usurpation of authority by Moses, if unchecked, would be fatal to the liberties of Israel. In other words, if they still kept Moses on the throne, this would be a risk to the liberties of Israel. He also claimed that God had opened the matter to him and had authorized him to make, and now notice this, to make a change in the government before it should be too late. In other words, Korah is saying, if I could be placed on the throne, everything would function well in Israel. I wouldn't be dictatorial. I wouldn't tell you what to do. Everybody would be free to follow their own will. There would be freedom indeed. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 398, we find that the rebellion now proliferates among the congregation. It says, for a while the work of Korah had been carried out secretly. But now he came forward publicly. Notice that first of all it was secret, it was underhanded, it was quiet. But now it says he came forward publicly and openly challenged the leadership of Moses and Aaron. He openly charged that the people had been deprived of their liberty and independence. And so now the secret underhanded rebellion becomes open rupture and revolt among the children of Israel and the congregation begin taking sides. I'd like to read an interesting statement from Patriarchs and actually it's from volume 3 of the testimonies where the strategy of Korah, Datham and Abiram is described how they were able to win over the people. It says there, there is nothing which will please the people better 
than to be praised and flattered when they are in darkness and wrong and deserve reproof. By the way this is happening immediately after Israel has been excluded from the land of Canaan. If you look at the context. Moses says we're not going to go into Canaan now, we're going to spend 40 years in the wilderness. And, and the people sent in a delegation and they were defeated in the promised land. And so they came back and they cried. They said Moses is to blame for this. See if we didn't have Moses as a leader, Korah said I would take you into the promised land. And so the people didn't want to hear that they didn't go into the promised land because they were so bad because they'd sinned against the Lord. They wanted to hear how good they were. She continues saying, Korah gained the ears of the people and next their sympathies by re representing Moses as an overbearing leader. He said that he was too harsh, too exacting, too dictatorial, and that he reproved the people as though they were sinners when they were a holy people, sanctified to the Lord, and the Lord was among them. Korah, the leading spirit, professed great wisdom in discerning the true reason for their trials and afflictions. So the way in which Korah was able to win over many of the people was in flattering them and telling them what they wanted to hear to make them feel good about themselves if you please. And so multitudes among Israel now started joining the rebellion. In fact in Patriarchs and Prophets page 400 we are told a large part of the congregation openly sided with Korah. Now it would have been very easy for God to simply snuff out Korah, Dathan and Abiram, the 250 and all of those who had participated in this rebellion. But it's interesting to notice that God did not destroy them immediately. Because it was necessary for Israel to see the fruits of this rebellion before they were destroyed. Interestingly enough when Lucifer rebelled in heaven, God did not destroy him and those he, who he recruited all at once. In fact we're told in Patriarchs and Prophets page 41, God permitted Satan to carry forward his work until his spirit of disaffection ripened into active revolt. And Revelation chapter 12 tells us that there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought. What has, had begun as a secret underhanded endeavor now became open revolt, both in the days of Korah and also in heaven. Now how did Moses confront this crisis in Israel? We might have thought that Moses would have stepped forward and said to Korah, Dathan and Abiram, Folks, you want to know who I am? I am Moses. I have been called by the Lord. I'm the ruler in Israel. And don't you forget it? He could have done that. But do you know that Moses actually didn't even defend himself? He must allow God to defend and describe his position. Notice number 16 verses 4 and 5. Number 16 verses 4 and 5. It says, So when Moses heard it, he fell on his face, and he spoke to Korah and all his company, saying, Tomorrow morning the Lord will show who is his. Who will show? The Lord will show who is his and who is holy and he will cause him to come near to him. That one whom he chooses, he will cause to come near to him. Interesting. Ellen White commenting on this in Patriarchs and Prophets page 400 has this to say, It was evident that the sympathies of the people were with the disaffected party. But Moses made no effort at self vindication. He solemnly appeared, appealed to God in the presence of the congregation 
as a witness to the purity of his motives and the uprightness of his conduct and implored him to be his judge. Now do you remember when Lucifer rebelled in heaven? When his position was questioned, what did Jesus say? He said to Lucifer, don't you know who I am? I'm the son of the living God. I am your creator. How dare you think that you can take my position in my throne? Is that what happened? No. Actually in Patriarchs and Prophets, page 36, a statement which is rather long, I'm not going to read it. Ellen White says that, that the Father called all of the heavenly host together, just like the congregation of Israel was called together. And now God the Father explained the position of Jesus Christ to the heavenly hosts. Jesus did not self-vindicate himself, but he allowed his Father to explain his true position. Now you might be wondering, what was so terrible about Korah and the 250 leaders in Israel wanting to be priests. What's so bad about that? Shouldn't you aspire to a high and holy office? Allow me to read from number 16 verses 9 through 11 where the issue was. Because we're going to come now to the application how this applies to us today. Because this whole story is written many times in the church. Now notice number 16 verses 9 through 11. Here Moses is speaking and he says this, Is it a small thing to you that the God of Israel has separated you from the congregation of Israel to bring you near to Himself, to do the work of the tabernacle of the Lord, and to stand before the congregation to serve them? Now do you think it's a small office that God has called you to? as Levites? Continue saying in verse 10, and that he has brought you near to himself, you and all your brethren, the sons of Levi with you, and are you seeking the priesthood also? What were they doing? They were dissatisfied with their position. They wanted an office to which God had not called them. They might have had the necessary qualifications and the necessary abilities to perform it, but that made no difference because they had not been, not been called to that position. In other words, aren't you satisfied with the position that God has given you? Why do you aspire to the priesthood? In verse 11 it says, Therefore you and all your company are gathered together, and now I want you to notice this, are gathered together against the Lord. And what is Aaron that you murmur against him? Who were they rising against when they desired the office of the priesthood and they were not satisfied with the office to which God had called them? They were rebelling against the Lord. They were repeating the story of Lucifer in heaven who was dissatisfied with the position for which God had anointed him and he wanted a higher position. He wanted the position of the king and he wanted the position of his spokesman. You see only ministers which had been ordained by God for that function had the right to minister in the sanctuary. They did not seek their position. They did not campaign for their position. They were called by God to their office and all of the rest, no matter what their ability was, were disqualified because they were not called to that holy office. I'm sure that many of those 250 individuals were very well qualified and had the ability to perform the work of the priesthood in terms of being able to do it. But what disqualified them or qualified them was not whether they were able to do it or not, whether they could do it well or not, it was whether God had called them to that particular function and position. They were disqualified not because of their abilities, they were disqualified because God had not called them to this sacred office. And the same was true with Lucifer. 
He was called to a specific position to occupy under the leadership of God the Father and His Son Jesus. Just like Korah was to be, and the Levites were to be under the direction of Moses as the ruler and Aaron as the priest. It's interesting to notice how God chose to vindicate the leadership of Moses and Aaron. And you know this is something terrible, you know there, these are the passages of Scripture that we don't like to read when we talk about the character of God. You know we like to study the Gospels, you know about Jesus being love, and by the way God is love even in what we're going to read about. Because when you start aspiring to position for which God has not called you, the result is disorder. See God has established a certain order for things to function properly, and when you try to occupy a position that you, that you were not been called for, to, then your position is left vacant and the result is chaos in the congregation. Chaos in the universe. You see, the angels, they fulfill the mission for which God has called them. And there's different ranks of angels. And all of the loyal angels fulfill the role that God has called them to. They don't aspire to a higher or to a lower position. They simply take their orders from the Lord. Notice number 16, 29 and 30. Here Moses is speaking and he says this, if these men die naturally like all men, as if they die a, a natural death although there's nothing natural about death, or if they are visited by the common fate of all men, in other words they pass away because they got old, then the Lord has not sent me. But if the Lord creates a new thing, and the earth opens its mouth and swallows them up with all that belongs to them and they don't go down alive into the pit that's a very important expression, alive into the pit then you will understand that these men have rejected the Lord. Who were they rejecting by aspiring to an office to which God had not called them? They were rejecting the Lord. This is serious folks very serious. And do you know what happened? It tells us in Numbers chapter 16 that they did not die a natural death. In fact we're told that God vindicated the leadership of Moses and Aaron by making the earth open up and swallow up Korah and the conspirators, the fellow conspirators were burned with fire that fell from heaven and the people who sympathized with them also perished. You know this is a serious matter. This aspiring to a position which God has not called you to even if you have the qualifications to perform it. Now let's read from Numbers chapter 16 beginning with verse 31 it describes this moment. It says, Now it came to pass as he finished speaking all these words that the ground split apart under them and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed them up with their households and all the men with Korah with all their goods. So they and all those with them went down alive into the pit. I want you to remember that expression, alive into the pit the earth closed over them and they perished from among the congregation. Then all Israel who were around them fled at their cry for they said lest the earth swallow us up also. And now notice that not only did the earth, the pit or the abyss swallow them up but it says and a fire came out from the Lord and consumed the 250 who were offering incense before the Lord. I guess God takes very seriously people who officiate as ministers when they are not called to be ministers. And He wanted God, He wanted Israel to remember this. And so do you know what, were, what was done with the 250 censers? Because the story says that, that uh, the 250 princes brought their censers and they were going to offer the incense in the sanctuary just like priests. And Moses said, bring your censers. And that's when they were swallowed up, when they were going to exercise a position for which God had not called them. Do you know what was done with the censers? The censers were hammered out 
and they were used as a covering for the altar so that every time that Israel contemplated the, the metal that had been hammered out and that covered the altar they would remember this rebellion so that they would not repeat the same rebellion in fact it says in number 16 and verse 40 about hammering out these censers to be a memorial to the children of Israel now listen to this, that no outsider who is not a descendant of Aaron should come near to offer incense before the Lord that he might not become like Korah and his companions just as the Lord had said to him through Moses and so the leadership of Moses and Aaron was vindicated. Have you ever read the way in which Satan and his followers will come to their end? In Isaiah chapter 14 and verse 15 it says that Satan will end up swallowed in the pit. And Revelation chapter 20 in several verses speaks about those who are rebellious against the Lord who are outside the congregation of Israel says fire came down from heaven and devoured them. Now do you know that this story as, I, as we've noticed in our study is actually a type of the great controversy between Christ and Satan on a narrow scale. Allow me to read you a statement that we find in Patriarchs and Prophets page 403 where Ellen White grasped this parallel that I'm sharing with you this morning it's not an invention of mine it's actually found in Patriarchs and Prophets this is what she says in the rebellion of Korah is seen the working out upon a narrower stage of the same spirit that led to the rebellion of Satan in heaven it was pride and ambition that prompted Lucifer to complain of the government of God and to seek the overthrow of the order which had been established in heaven. Since his fall, it has been his object to infuse the same spirit of envy and discontent, the same ambition for position and honor into the minds of men. He thus worked upon the minds of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram to arouse the desire for self-exaltation and excite envy, distrust, and rebellion. Satan caused them to reject God as their leader by rejecting the men of God's appointment. Yet while in their murmuring against Moses and Aaron they blasphemed God. They were so deluded as to think themselves righteous and to regard those who had faithfully reproved their sins as actuated by Satan. Is his spirit still alive and, and well on planet earth today? Absolutely. Now allow me to give you some actual, practical, present examples. And I'm going to get myself in a little bit of hot water right now. This is an issue which I don't usually touch upon. the issue of the ordination of women to the gospel ministry. According to the scriptures has God called women to be ordained to the gospel ministry? No. Has he given women a function? A very important function of service in the church? Absolutely, like the Levites. But he has not called them to be ministers, gospel ministers. And you know people who argue in favor of the ordination of women say women can do things just as well as men can. True. I'm sure many of the Levites could do things just as well as the priests. But what disqualified them was not ability or not having ability, what disqualified them was the fact that God had not called the Levites to that particular branch of ministry. It didn't mean that they were inferior, but they had a different what? They had a different function. 
and you know this false issue is created that that Fresno Central Church does not believe that women, women and men are equal because we don't believe that we should ordain women to the gospel ministry let me explain this the Bible says that God the Father is the head of Jesus Jesus takes his orders from his Father even after sin comes to an end the Bible says that the Son will subject himself to his Father so that the Father is all in all and so I suppose that because Jesus has subjected himself to his Father and he accepts his Father as the head that Jesus is inferior to his Father no because Jesus said I and my Father are what? are one the Father and the Son are equal but they have different functions are you following me? and so is it, it is with the gospel ministry I love, I love the women of the church and women in the church have many ministries that they, that they should be involved in that God has, has opened up for them but the gospel ministry is not one of them does that mean that Pastor Bohr is a male chauvinist pig? no you know that I'm not that way it simply means that we want to preserve here the gospel order that God has established now if God has not called women to the gospel ministry and, and they are campaigning to be members of the gospel ministry and they are looking to occupy that position in the gospel ministry let me ask you in what way is that different than what Korah, Dathan and Abiram wanted? I'll leave that for food for thought, it got very quiet in here do I believe that women are inferior than men? no, what I believe is that women have a different function than men and by the way I'm not alone, there are many denominations, non adventist denominations that have gone down this road they followed the Bible order is the spirit still alive today of people who criticize the preacher because he says things that people don't like? no not at Central, all those people have left <laughs> the spirit is still well alive because many people come to church because they want to hear smooth things they want to hear nice things they want to hear the preacher say about how good they are and how wonderful they are you know one time somebody said to Ellen White I think you should preach less about duty and more about the love of Jesus and Ellen White said I'll preach what God asked me to preach yes the, the love of Jesus along with duty it's not either or let me ask you, is this spirit of rivalry still alive at constituency meetings? oh now, now George Johnson who is here uh, he, he can identify with this a little bit better Central California has had very peaceful constituency sessions not much politicking, you know people go in, we vote everybody back in in a matter of half an hour and then we do our uh, constitution and bylaws business and then we're gone praise the Lord, but I've been in conferences where there are individuals maneuvering to get those higher positions in the conference office some individuals even wanting to knock off the president of the conference so they can be president whose spirit is that? that's the spirit of Lucifer it also happens in the local church around nominating committee time ooh let's bring it closer to home here there are people who aspire to a certain position and if they're not elected to that specific position they, they're offended, they say how dare they not have placed me as an elder this year? or how dare they pla place me as a, as a mere deacon when I should be an elder? or I wanted to be the Sabbath school superintendent? it happens the same today and all of these issues really go back to the spirit of Lucifer the spirit of wanting to be up there the spirit of wanting to have a higher position not being satisfied with the position which God has placed us in you know there's no better place than the place that God has given to us to serve and Jesus taught that by saying that the greatest is the person who serves the most now allow me to get in, into another little controversial issue before we come to an end you know there's this common idea that in marriage there is no order 
Do you know that God established a certain order in marriage? The man is the head of the wife. And the Apostle Paul said after Jesus died on the cross that the wife is to be subject to her husband. Oh no, I'm going to get in trouble here. I have to go out the back door. Is that the order God has established? Yes. And when that order is not respected, what do you have? You have chaos. You have disorder. Now at the same time God says that wives should be subject to their husbands, but he also says husbands love your wives. Let's look at the other side of the equation. See it's not a problem being subject if your husband loves you. For Jesus there's no problem being subject to his father because he knows his father loves him. His father were, would only do that which is in his good in, own good interest. Isn't that right? And so for Jesus it's a piece of cake to, to be subject to the will of his father because he knows that his father loves him. And so it should be in marriage. The man should be the head of the household. The woman should be subject to her husband but the husband should love his wife. And the apostle Paul says he should love his wife as himself. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. You shall love your wife as yourself. Basically the Lord Jesus expressed this concept that I'm trying to share with you today in Matthew 23 and verse 12 when he says, He who exalts himself will be humbled. And he who humbles himself will be exalted. This is the essence of the teachings of Jesus. You see, Jesus gave the example. Jesus was way up there in heaven and it says in Philippians chapter 2 that he made himself of no reputation, he emptied himself and he became a servant. Didn't have to, but he who was the ruler becomes a servant. And then in Philippians 2 it says that because he became a servant the Father gave him a name that is above every name and he has called upon every knee to bow in the name of Jesus because Jesus humbled himself he was exalted. Lucifer was different because with Lucifer you have him occupying this position down here and he says I want that position up there and so instead of humbling himself he exalts himself and where is he going to end up? in the pit down there so you have the mystery of godliness and the mystery of iniquity. The mystery of godliness is when you're up here and you come down to serve and then God exalts you. The mystery of iniquity is when you're down here and you want to occupy this high position for which God has not called you and as a result you will be humbled. I'd like to end by reading a passage from Patriarchs and Prophets page 404 where Ellen White making the final application of this story of Korah, Dathan and Abiram says this, it is by sinful indulgence that men give Satan access to their minds and they go from one stage of wickedness to another. It is by sinful indulgence, notice. The rejection of light darkens the mind and hardens the heart so that it is easier for them to take the next step in sin and to reject still clearer light until at last their habits of wrongdoing become fixed. Sin ceases to appear sinful to them. He who faithfully preaches the word of God thereby condemning their sins too often incurs their hatred unwilling to endure the pain and sacrifice necessary to reform, they turn upon the Lord's servant and denounce his reproofs as uncalled for and severe. In other words, when the, when the preacher points out sin, stone the preacher, don't change the sin. She continues saying, like Korah, they declare that the people are not at fault. It is the reprover that causes all the trouble. And soothing their consciences with this deception, the jealous and disaffected combine to sow discord in the church 
and weaken the hands of those who would build it up. Folks, let's not be on that side. Ellen White says that, that, that the emptying of self is the essence of the teachings of Jesus. Making self of none effect. Making others first. Humbling yourself. And you know what? God someday is going to exalt us. Don't worry about it. You know, he who exalts himself will be humbled. And he who humbles himself will be exalted. And so may God help us to be satisfied with the position that we have. And do it with a smile and with joy. As a result, the church will be much more coordinated. It will function in the order that God has established. And we will have joy. And we will have peace in our personal experience and our walk with the Lord.